All right. How's everyone enjoying Hawaii? Good. Yeah. How about you? I, I, I love it. Um, the problem is I came here sunburned. So now after being here, it's not helping. <laughs> so I'm like the only Greek lobster right now. I'm like red underneath. It's like, yeah. I was saying before that, that a bunch of uh, people in Greece wearing fisherman caps like felt a tremor in the forest because one of their own couldn't handle the sun. So I'm kind of ashamed about that. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, I'll live. I'll live. <laughs> Um, I, I guess I was born here, though, so I guess that, that makes me less Greek or something. <laughs> here, meaning USA. Um, so I guess I guess I'll get started. Uh, we're going to be talking about hacking smart contracts. Uh, it's it's something that's near and dear to my heart. <laughs> um, I basically, for the last uh, 13 years or so, have been breaking into banks for a living. That's pretty much what I do. Um, my title CTO, but that's, that's just like a very lofty title, I guess, to get me into doors. <laughs> but I really do spend about half my time uh, breaking into banks, like I said, uh, financial clients, uh, and the other half kind of talking about it and explaining what we do. So, so it's a pretty fun job, travel a lot, get around. Uh, but because of the intense financial focus over the years, because literally that's where the money is, right, um, I got exposed to blockchain really early. I mean, we're talking, it was like 2010, I was already messing around with it um, in depth. Uh, so it's just a little bit after Satoshi Paper, which is 2008. Uh, so banks were interested in it first, so they talked to us about it first, and, and we kind of started getting into it. Um, so if anyone here has ever done uh, an ethical hack of an application, uh, I just have one quick question for you. Have you ever done one where you said to yourself, oh my god, this code is so beautiful, I'm going to turn in a blank report? Has that ever happened? Probably not, right? Now imagine code that once it's written and published, it lives forever. You can never get rid of it. So that's what we're talking about here today. <laughs> once something goes on the blockchain, it's there forever. It's indelible. I mean, that's the whole point, immutable. That's the idea of the blockchain. Once it's there, it's there. So we're talking about code that needs maybe a little extra as, as far as uh, auditing is concerned. So, Everyone's heard of Bitcoin, you know, I'm mean, sure, everyone's heard of that. Uh, when Satoshi wrote that paper in 2008, uh, he had some pretty lofty goals. Uh, you can say he might have met them. His idea was to bring banking to the world. 50% uh, of the world has no access to banking. Uh, so that's kind of what he was trying to solve uh, with this form of digital money. Uh, and he was also trying to solve this uh, digital spend, double spend problem. You know, if I email you guys a photo, I still have the photo. If I email you 100 bucks, I better not have the 100 bucks, because <laughs> otherwise it's not money, right? So solving digital double spend with a distributed ledger was the idea. The idea that these transactions would be posted and spread around the world for all to see so you could see that it's fair. He sent that money to her, so that way that money's gone. So it was a pretty cool idea. Um, it fell a little short. You know, Bitcoin went through its volatile phases. It went up to $19,000, now it's down to like six. Uh, so it was, it was a sort of crazy roller coaster ride. And unfortunately, it never became what Satoshi envisioned. Um, it never became a form of money that's easy to use. Uh, how many people really use it for anything? No one. People were just buying it and hoarding it. That was the idea, you know, the HODL term. Uh, so it was never really money. And you can argue that it was never really cheap to use. Transaction fees started getting out of hand. Um, they started getting slow. You know, it just started getting a little bizarre. So. It's, it's a neat idea, but it doesn't do enough to be interesting. Uh, much more interesting is the other big blockchain in the world, and that's Ethereum. And, and that's what we're going to be talking about today, uh, technology and Ethereum. So what's beautiful about Ethereum is, rather than just being a form of money or moving money, Ethereum is Turing complete. Okay, so that means it can actually run programs, like a computer. So when you do something on the Ethereum blockchain, you're really doing something on the EVM, the Ethereum virtual machine. It's a global computer. And you're literally renting time on that global computer to run code. And the code you run is actually smart contracts. Um, so it can save state. Uh, it can do things like that, whereas Bitcoin can just move money. That's all it can really do. There are some companies that write goofy overlays to Bitcoin, but that, that's not really the same thing. The actual Ethereum project is about having this global computer, supercomputer in a way. <laughs> um, so we'll be talking about that. So when you have power like this, what do you do with it? You, you make digital cats. That's what you do. So <laughs> we take all this great, amazing, world-changing power, 
And last fall, people started making these silly digital beanie babies, essentially. You know, you would breed them and create interesting combinations and end up with unique cats. And for a while, I don't have this slide up here for no reason. Uh, for a while, the transactions were up 6x on Ethereum. It was slowing everything down. Just, it was causing a complete meltdown of Ethereum because people were playing this ridiculous game. Uh, and in December, one of them sold for $100,000. So it's, people can get like really insane with completely non-existent things. Uh, but it did, it did introduce something kind of useful. Uh, this idea of ERC721, it's a token that lets you buy things that aren't real. So uh, instead of silly cats, you can use it for like software licenses or things like that. Uh, they're not real, but they have real value. So that's the idea. But smart contracts, Let, let's, let's worry about this and not cats. <laughs> so smart contracts are amazing. Um, it's really limited only by your imagination as a developer. Um, it's business logic. Uh, it runs on the EVM, as we said. And um, it's semi-autonomous. So once you write it, it kind of just does its thing forever. Remember that word, forever. <laughs> you, just, you, can, you can point to new versions of them, but once you publish one, it is going to exist there forever. It's just not going to go anywhere. So because they can't really be patched, it's a good idea to try and do the right thing when it comes to auditing them before you publish them. So, so that's where folks like I'd come in. Um, so I, I've seen all sorts of creative uses for this in private companies. Uh, the, the dream is like decentralized government, um, having wills, having like property deeds, all sorts of things like that on the blockchain, all being handled. So if you send money to someone, then it proves that your land was moved to a new owner. Like really, really amazing stuff they're, they're thinking of doing. Uh, in reality, people are still, you know, starting a little smaller. But um, I like the idea of maybe one day there could be an Uber without an Uber. You know, just have smart contracts negotiating the rides with people for a small little fee instead of, you know, a huge amount. Um, or Airbnb without Airbnb, things like that. So the code can get pretty intense. Um, you just have to, like I said, make sure it's secure. So the reason I'm so concerned security, uh, I, I can name actually billions of reasons I'm, I'm concerned with security here. Uh, the first big hack of the Ethereum smart contract uh, was two years ago. It was, the, it was called the DAO, and it was basically a decentralized organization. It was supposed to act with a smart contract sort of like a VC. You were able to like invest in projects you were interested in, and if you didn't find that it was suitable to your needs, you could take the money back out. Uh, it was the taking money back out that became a problem, as we'll get to. Um, because of a flaw that I'll show in a few slides, uh, someone was able to remove 3.6 million Ether, which if that attack happened today, it would be $1.6 billion. Now, when was the last time you saw a hack that would get you $1.6 billion with just a few quick lines of code? I mean, it, it just doesn't happen. So this, this is, like, serious. <laughs> At the time, Ether was worth less, yes. But it just shows that you have to do due with these things because of the mass amounts of financial damage they can cause. Uh, we're also going to look at something that has millions uh, behind it, uh, a couple of attacks against parity, as we'll see, uh, which got pretty expensive. So the problem isn't going away. That was two years ago, and then a year ago or so, the parity stuff started happening. Uh, this, this pretty interesting project, uh, the guys that wrote a tool we're going to talk about in a minute, they did this audit of 970,000 smart contracts. Yes, you heard that right. I can't even believe there are 970,000 smart contracts. I know I didn't audit them. Uh, so after they ran uh, this new tool, they found that 34,000 of them were susceptible to financial attack. So it's a small percentage, but we're talking major attacks, uh, crippling attacks. Um, there's three types of major attacks that they're vulnerable to. So suicidal contracts, that means they were contracts that could be killed by anyone. And if there's money tied up in a contract, you don't want to be able to kill it. That's, that's very bad. <laughs> uh, there are prodigal contracts that let you send money to just about anyone, which is, of course, bad. And greedy contracts, which basically just take your money and don't let you ever get it out. Um, so those are the three types. But to find 34,000 live on the blockchain was kind of eye-opening. It just shows that people aren't, still aren't really doing uh, due diligence and auditing these things. So the language we use for smart contracts is Solidity. 
Uh, I wish I could stand up here and tell you that it's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. Uh, in fact, it's really not, and it's really a pain. Uh, Solidity was written for the wrong reason. Um, it was written to make it easy for people who are used to C and JavaScript to get, to get used to it. That's not the best reason to make a language a certain way. Um, when you're dealing with blockchain, you have to worry about uh, very deterministic code because of the way transactions are finalized. Uh, so as a result, we were kind of like hamstrung by how the code would run anyway. But when you combine that with, with the certain quirks in Solidity, you see that it can cause some problems. Uh, I can't really go into fully, you know, uh, hey, how to code in Solidity today, but I could just show you the vulnerabilities. Uh, one interesting thing, though, it's very in-demand skill. Uh, if, if you learn Solidity, I used to joke that you'll be like the sixth person who knows it, but that's an exaggeration. It's more like the tenth person who knows it. So if you want to learn it, you know, you'll be maybe number 11 on the outside. Um, <laughs> but a lot of companies will pay big bucks if you can write solid Solidity. <laughs> So when I'm doing ethical hack, it's, it's uh, usually in the early dev phases. Uh, I don't like to do it after it's already on the blockchain and causing havoc. Obviously, it's too late. Uh, so usually what I'm getting, given is a .sol file. And um, what happens is that .sol file will be converted to what's called bytecode, and that bytecode will go up on the EVM. That's the basic process. Um, you can audit things that are up. You can, you can reverse them back down. My friend Matt wrote a, a, code, uh, a program called Porosity and that lets you pull uh, EVM bytecode down and read it in, with human readable solidity again. Uh, when, I, when I do an audit, I like to use Atom because it's plugins. The language Ethereum plugin actually lets you see the highlighting. So when you're doing variables and things like that, it highlights them. It's pretty cool. It makes it at a glance easier to see if silly mistakes were made. Uh, and Ether Atom lets you actually um, compile to bytecode right inside your IDE, so that's kind of neat. And then there's Remix browser-based. There's some other ones. So I, use, I usually use just that to look at it with my own eyes. Uh, but then there are interesting tools. Uh, one of them has been around for a while. Uh, Oyente, which was the first um, smart contract tool, has gotten a lot better recently. And I mean a lot better. When it first came out, it only did uh, four valid vulnerabilities and one invalid one. Now it does six valid ones uh, with one invalid one. I'll explain that in a moment. Um, also, what's really neat about it is now, it actually shows you the very line that the flaw is on. In the early days, you would run it, and it would say, uh-oh, you have reentrancy. And then you have like a 1,000 line smart contract, and you're like, where? <laughs> where is it? I gotta go through all this anyway, you know. Now it actually shows you the, the line, which is pretty cool. So you're gonna wanna, um, you're gonna wanna experiment with this if you wanna get into this. Um, it's a little temperamental, uh, so what I like to do is just download the Docker that the developers always provide, add other tools I need, and then I do a commit, and then I have this lockdown Oyente that I can run without anything breaking. Because they use some really weird dependencies like Z3, Z3 uh, Theorem Prover and some other stuff that gets a little temperamental. Uh, a similar tool is Manticore, um, and it, it actually discovers all the functions in a contract and, and tries to get an error to be generated so you can see if there's flaws. Uh, it's still in the works, it's, it's getting better. Um, so it's, it might be something I start demoing more often, but, but Oyente is a pretty great start uh, because of what it finds. It can, it can detect um, integer underflow, overflow, which we'll be talking about today, the parity bug, which we'll be talking about today. Um, and it can also do reentrancy, the DAO attack. So it's pretty good stuff. They also wrote the tool Mayan, and Mayan is the one that was used for that uh, 970,000 smart contract audit. Uh, this code, uh, th th this actually scares me, this tool, and I'll tell you why. Because it's a little hard to make out, but not only does it show you where a vulnerability is, but it actually shows you the very injection you need to craft to exploit it. So it's, it's like brain dead simple. It literally says, hey, you want to steal all the money from this? Just you know, insert this line here, and then, okay. So now we're going to have a new generation of, like, Ethereum script kitties or something that are, like, attacking smart contracts, and they, they couldn't even write one to save their life, but they're able to attack it because of this tool. Uh, that, that would be pretty scary, you know? It could happen. Um, so th this is something worth playing with, too, if, if you're going to do an audit. So, so when I look at smart contract, I just go through a basic methodology. Um, I interview the devs. Uh, in my normal ethical hacking days, uh, I always hated the, the dreaded kickoff call 
because every developer in the world thinks that their code is so unique and you've never seen anything like it before. And trust me, after you do like 200 of these things a year, you've seen it before. But with smart contracts, you should actually talk to the developers because a lot of times what they think they're doing, they're not really doing. So certain problems get introduced just because they didn't write it the way they thought they did. Uh, so then I look at the solve file, like I said. Um, I try compiling it to make sure it's not erroring or anything basic like that. Um, I dissect the code flow. I go through to understand if, if it's really doing what it's supposed to be doing. Then I run Oyente. Um, I joke and say cross fingers, but the tool has gotten a lot better. <laughs> I run Manticore, run Mayan. Uh, so when you run all those tools, you can sometimes get some low-hanging fruit. And, and when we're talking about low-hanging fruit here, we're not talking about insecure cookies, right? We're talking about something that can you know, move millions of dollars sometimes, too. So sometimes you get a, quite a bang for the buck just by running the tools, but then you have to start manually checking anyway. So we'll kick it off with a look at uh, reentrancy. So this is the thing that allows $1.7 million, uh, billion dollars rather, to be moved in the DAO. And, it, and it's so simple, it's almost painful. Now remember what I said about Solidity having like an order that it likes to follow. Um, in this case, it does something that sounds on the surface like it's correct. Like when you think about auditing, you would think, well, you would move money and then you would tell the program, hey, he just moved money, so let's audit that that money's gone. It sounds logical, right? Unfortunately, in Solidity, it introduces a very dangerous vulnerability. So if you have to use the call uh, function, which that line with the little explosion, line seven, shows, if you have to use that call function instead of send, because send is more secure, but you can't use it all the time. If you have to use call, what could happen is an external contract can constantly make calls from this contract and say, I'd like some money, I'd like some money, I'd like some money. And it can just keep attacking line seven without line eight's accounting ever happening. So that's what happened with the DAO. Um, even though the person wasn't entitled to all that money, the smart contract was able to just continually request money because it never got to the audit line. So I'm about to show you how really difficult it is to fix this problem. So keep an eye on line seven and eight. And that's really it, you just flip them, see that? That's it. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, wow, right? <laughs> if you do the audit first and you say, hey, all the money is now going to be gone because of this next step, it's impossible to do that repeated call. Because once it hits the audit, it zeroes it out, and then it, it releases just the correct amount of funds. Uh, so it sounds counterintuitive, but this will prevent, in that case, $1.7 billion from being moved. And what's funny about this is a lot of these smart contract hacks that happen are that tiny. It's like one line, one, literally, as you'll see, one missing word, something like that, and then millions of dollars vanish. So it's, it's a little more critical. I have, to, I have to stress that. Because of the way the logic works and how it's semi-autonomous, it, it all happens so fast that no humans could respond. You know, It's not like you're watching money be drained. It's like all of a sudden, this transaction, you just all transactions look the same, ultimately. You just get this little transaction, and all of a sudden, millions of dollars are gone. And there's nothing you can do about it. You can't reverse it. Um, so in the DAO, it was actually, uh, it looked more like that, um, so it's a little more complicated. That's why I give the simpler version. Uh, but I think it's funny that the comment was like, be nice and get his rewards. It's like, yeah, okay. <laughs> there was nothing nice about the way this was implemented or how it was attacked, <laughs> ultimately. So back to the idea of just one word. Um, so this company, Parity, uh, it was created by one of the founders of uh, the Solidity language, actually. Uh, so Gavin Wood, he was one of the four guys that wrote Solidity. So you would think if he wrote Solidity, he'd be pretty darn good at writing code in Solidity, right? I mean, it just seems like it should work that way. Unfortunately, you know, humans make mistakes. <laughs> you always need a fresh set of eyes. So if, I don't know if it's easy to see, but um, the pink lines are the lines that were originally there when this code was attacked. And what happened with this wallet was, in Solidity, you have declarations. And if you don't label them public, private, internal, external, it defaults to public. So because they left out the declaration at the end of the line, everything became public, which means anyone can write to it, anyone can access it. So unfortunately, it, it led to a very, very simple attack. Um, all an attacker had to do was use a knit wallet to send a request to the wallet and say, hey, you're now mine. That's literally what he had to do. Because it was public, anyone could make a request that the wallet now be his or hers. Uh, and this guy did. 
So once he did that, the next request he made was to execute movement of the money to his other wallet so he can keep it. Now, he did this three times, and those three wallets he happened to do it to were all part of ICOs. So ICOs, obviously, are usually loaded with uh, money. Uh, so he was able to get $32 million in just a few minutes by just going after three wallets and doing that request, and that request, and that request. Um, this one group called the White Hack Group uh, saw this happening, and in a race against time, they went and tried hacking a bunch of other wallets to save the money and, like, kind of keep it. Uh, and then they promised to return it, and they did, which is good, because the White Hat Group would have to change their names if they didn't return it, right? So, so that's very good. It's very convenient. But they were able to save $220 million by, in a race against time, hacking all these other wallets while this guy was doing this. Uh, so, you know, every once in a while, folks step up. <laughs> Again, the most simple mistake, just leaving out that one declaration where, when it should have been internal, and then it became public instead. Uh, poor parity was hit again just a few months later. Now, this, this is really funny, uh, at least, you know, in a sad sort of way. <laughs> so, the parity multi-sig wallet. Now, multi-sig is a good idea, right? Multi-signature, you know, it, it, it enhances its security. Uh, the only problem is they wrote it so it used one wallet library, one. Now, whenever you do that, everything's tied to stand or fall with that one library. Um, and it was not initialized properly. So, kind of similar to the other attack, it allowed for someone to become its owner, okay? And all this was done accidentally, or so this guy claims. So he accidentally made two requests. Now, whenever I do something accidental, it's never two, you know? Like if I fall down the stairs, I then don't accidentally open a credit card in someone's name, you know? It just doesn't happen that way. So that's kind of how crazy his story is that this was accidental. Uh, but he accidentally called a knit wallet, like we saw in the other attack, to own the library, not the wallet, but the entire library that they all share. And then he accidentally called the kill method to destroy the wallet library. So it worked, he killed it. The problem is he froze all the multi-sig wallets forever. That's it, frozen. We're talking 513,000 ETH that cannot be recovered. They're just frozen. So that's like $220 million in current um, value. Uh, so it was a sloppy library implementation, and because of that one little coding mistake, those two accidental transactions were able to freeze all that money. So uh, it, it's no joke. Again, really, <laughs> you really have to know what you're doing when you look at Solidity code. Um, so the concept of overflows and underflows exists in Solidity too. Um, and, and there's a reason there's an odometer there. <laughs> so Solidity can handle 256-bit numbers. So the idea is an overflow will occur if you try and increment above that. You know. So what's interesting here is just like an odometer, if you have an old car, um, I restore like 60s and 70s cars for fun because I'm like really big and I don't fit in new cars. Um, but what happens is if you have most of them, uh, when you get to 99,999 miles, it rolls over and you get zero, right? So if you overflow a solidity number, the 256-bit number, you get zero. So it's interesting, um, and, and it, could, it could be an attack. But what's even more interesting is what happens if you underflow. So if you literally end up spending more money than you have and Solidity is not written correctly, the, the code, um, the reverse happens. So imagine the odometer going backwards. So if you spend more money than you have, ta-da, you now have all the money. <laughs> it literally rolls to the max number. Now, that is a nightmare scenario. <laughs> you know, like if people joke about someone having a shopping problem, imagine where every time they shop too much, they can then shop too much again. Uh, you know, that, that's, that's a real nightmare. Um, fortunately, it can be fixed very easily just by using the, um, the Zeppelin, uh, Open Zeppelin Safe Math Library. Um, but whenever I see code that doesn't use that, then I know we're going to have a very fun day when it comes time to report writing. So you got to watch that. So like I said, Solidity wasn't exactly written with security in mind, um, but hopefully one day we'll have something else. <laughs> so in the early days of writing these smart contracts, one type of smart contract that appeared all the time was uh, 
sort of like a Ponzi scheme, and, and I know people think that that's a scam, but I mean Ponzi more in the style of chain letters. Do you remember chain letters, the idea of a chain letter? You get in the mail, and it's like, hey, send a dollar to these five people, and then add your name, and, and then the idea was everyone would get rich, and you know, no one ever did it. They just kept the dollar, maybe. I don't know. Uh, so they, they started doing this with smart contracts, and the idea was in the early days when ETH wasn't really worth anything, you'd have stuff like this, where in King of Ether, you would pay an ETH, which is worth, you know, pennies, and you'd become what's called king of the ether. And then if someone wanted to depose you, they would pay, let's say, 1.5 ETH. A little bit of the money would go to the contract as like a VIG almost in gambling, like something that the contract keeps. And then you're the new king of the ether. And then someone would pay two, and they'd be the king of the ether. And it was like a digital chain mail kind of thing. Um, and it, you know, it, was, it was all harmless fun. The only problem is uh, if you have um, Contracts, wallets can be two types of contracts. So they can be contracts, accounts controlled by a contract, um, or human, externally owned. So when it's not owned by a human, things can go wrong. So one of these contract accounts was um, written in such a way that it didn't have enough gas. And, and we'll talk about what gas is in a second. So when you don't have enough gas, the contract will fail. So as a result, people were paying to become the new king of the ether, and they were becoming the new king of the ether, but the old king of the ether wasn't getting any money. So this was a really snowballing nightmare because everyone was paying, becoming it, and the old people weren't getting the money back. Uh, so it became a constant source of theft. Um, and all that just because the contract had a failure. So to, to try and clarify how that works, uh, so with unchecked send, uh, you can see the top one, I wrote a very short version of king of the ether. Um, if you send the money and it fails, the compensation will be set to true. So for the contract, as far as the contract's concerned, you got your money, it's happy, but it doesn't actually check that the money was given to you or not. Um, so if it's written instead on the bottom, I added the if with a throw, and if it doesn't detect the money going, it'll actually fail and let you know that there's a problem, so that prevents that from happening. So it goes from unchecked send to literally checked send. So that's really all that was needed to be done. Again, one line, basically, to prevent all those people from losing so much money. And the reason those contracts failed is because of gas. So we see lots of flaws with gas. Uh, if you have 2,300 gas, that's enough to, to log an incident, but it's not enough to actually execute a contract. So you want to have more than 2,300 gas. So if you were going to start a hacker magazine about Ethereum, you would call it 2,300 instead of 2,600. I'm just saying. Um, so that would be a thing to do. <laughs> so uh, blocks can only hold so much gas. Like look at the Jeep there, right? That's a block, I guess you could say. You could visualize it as a block. And if you put too much gas, that happens. So um, you, you can't do that. Uh, there's a great site, ETHSTATS, that tells you at any given moment how much gas will fit in a block. Right now it's at like 700, uh, I mean 7,909,000 or something like that. It's just under 8 million right now. Um, so that gas is paid by the externally owned account. So you have to make sure that there's enough gas there so it won't fail. So, withdraw, don't send. This, this is an interesting concept. You can have something fail in a contract and actually create a denial of service. Rather than have it be about stealing money, you can actually write it in such a way that when a contract makes a request, it'll fail and the whole thing will die and no one will be able to do anything and it will lead to mass frustration among users. Uh, so line 11 is a problem here um, because you could trap an unusable state uh, by having the richest be the address of a contract that has a fallback function. And if it fails, like we saw with, let's say, even the 2300 gas stipend or whatever, um, if it fails, that'll just kill the whole contract and it'll be a denial of service situation. So it's much better to do um, something like this. So when it's actually withdrawn, um, you can write a withdrawal function that will allow only the attacker's own funds to be affected. So if you go through the trouble of writing an actual withdrawal function, if, if the contract is attempt, if someone attempts to try and pull money from the contract and it fails, it'll just fail their external contract, not the actual main one. So that's a smarter way to do it. So it, it requires a lot more coding, but it's a lot safer because there's no chance of someone getting cute and doing a denial of service attack. So uh, a point about encryption here. Um, most things on the blockchain are in you know, human readable form. There's a reason for that, right? A blockchain is literally a distributed ledger of transactions. If you can't read it, well, it's not really any kind of ledger at all, is it? Um, so whenever I see people write games or anything like that for, for Ethereum, 
they're forgetting that you can read the transactions. So if you make a game where people are making guesses uh, to see who gets something right, you can literally just watch the blocks and say, oh, that person gets that, that person gets that. And then as the options start to narrow down, you can jump in with what's very likely the correct guess and win money unfairly or whatever. So you have to be careful with this idea of just trusting that no one's going to be watching these transactions go through. Um, so there's going to be, in the new Metropolis fork, which we're going to talk about, there's going to be abstractions that should help with this. Uh, transaction ordering dependence. Okay, so that idea of blocks going by, you know, one at a time, uh, it, it actually has meaning. If you write a contract that requires certain transactions to come at certain times, you're going to get into trouble really quickly. So if you look at, at section 8 over there, it begins a puzzle, um, which begins uh, letting people make guesses, etc. And then in 15, it starts um, the whole process of um, of executing the functions. So once, you're, once you set up this puzzle, people can start playing the game, basically. Now, 18 and 19, that little loop over there, that's a part of the contract that lets the owner literally change what the prize is, right in the middle of the contract. So here you end up with a very interesting race condition, where the owner can watch these, this, these guesses be made on the chain, and then when he starts to see that people are getting close, he can take a gamble, jump in, and say that 100 ETH prize is now like half an ETH or no ETH at all. And because of transaction order of dependence, the way this contract's written, in theory, he has a pretty good shot at getting in his change request before you submit your guess. So the winner might think he's about to get all this money, and at the very last second, there's no money because it was a race against time. And he can even help this process along. He can pay extra gas. He can do tricks like that to get his transaction to go first. So it's always super dangerous to have a contract that relies on a certain order of transactions happening. Because if someone can reverse the order, this is just one example, changing a prize, if you can reverse the order, you can cause mayhem to happen. Um, a safer way to do something like this is to have like a shared secret, sort of like a, a shared commit where you send out to everyone, hey, this is the prize and it's hidden and at the last minute, you know, I'll give you the key to see what it is or something like that. Something that can't be tampered with. So I talked before about how Ante finds something that's not valid anymore. Um, it still flags it, so it might cause confusion, so I want to mention it. Call stack depth limit. Uh, so this is the idea that... Um, you can exhaust a contract by going up to the full 1,024 frames, and then when you get to that last one, you can inject something malicious. Um, this is no longer possible. After you have P150, uh, Ethereum was written in a way now that if you try to exhaust a contract, when you get to 63, 64 of the money, I know it's weird, I don't know why they chose that. Um, I do know why, but I'm not gonna explain it. <laughs> so when, when you get to that obscure number, um, it starts to become exponentially more expensive to exhaust the contract. So unless you're talking about the ability to move in one transaction mass amounts of money, which really doesn't happen because of the way it's structured, uh, it wouldn't be cost effective to try and pay to do this attack. So I guess it's good that it shows it because it's poorly written code if it flags it, but, but you can't really exhaust a contract by frames anymore. Sometimes uh, attacks can be very sneaky. Um, people will publish smart contract code all the time, and it looks good to the to first glance. Uh, in this one, there's something very subtle going on here. So you see there's a payout cursor ID with an underscore at the end, and there's a payout cursor ID with no underscore at the end. So what's actually happening from 10 to 12 is the money is being added to the one with the underscore at the end, but then the actual payout is going to the one without, which means none of the incrementation actually goes to anybody. And if you look quickly, you'll miss it. You'll think, well, there's nothing wrong with this code. It all checks out. Uh, but it's such a subtle thing, that one little line. Because then the money will default to a zero account, which will probably be the owner of the contract. So you could see that sometimes people will publish things like this in like, good faith, supposedly. And, and there's really like a lurking uh, flaw. So you've got to look at this stuff very carefully. Um, so it sounds like transaction order dependence, but there's something called timestamp dependence, too. Um, the time, you don't want to write contracts that allow um, for the timing that they hit a miner to mean anything because that can be fudged a lot. Um, you can have 
you can have them vary a little bit. So there's sort of a 30 second rule. You don't want to write transactions that when they hit are that sensitive that 30 seconds will throw them off because timers can be off at the transaction level. Um, the other thing we always look for is uh, business logic flaws. This is still a very new field, and like I said, when you talk to developers, they think they're writing one thing, but they're actually writing something else. So I try to understand what they think they're accomplishing so I can see if the flow really matches it. Uh, and it's still pretty cool, because there's great Eureka moments, and the opportunity here for finding zero days all the time, stuff that no one ever thought to exploit before, it, it literally happens all the time in this field, which is pretty exciting. Uh, and one of the most important things you have to look for is how any company handles separating public and private data. Uh, ever since the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance launched, uh, it was Mardi Gras a couple of years ago, um, a lot of companies, about 220 big ones, you know, like BP, the oil company, you know, like really big companies, uh, they're all interested in having these private Ethereum chains in-house so they can do sort of like secret things internally and then when they need to transact with greater Ethereum and the rest of the world to move money or whatever, they can do it. Um, so JPMC Quorum uh, project, uh, it's, it's public knowledge, I'm not violating a bank's trust here. <laughs> uh, they published open source how they do it. They created this great system with called the private for transaction. So anytime you do a transaction in, in the bank, let's say, um, the private for transaction makes sure that if anyone sees that transaction, it'll just be a meaningless hash. But if you're the person who owns it, you can actually get from an internal transaction manager the sensitive data that it's tied to. So it's pretty neat. They can use Ethereum in a private chain inside, do very critical stuff inside the bank, and if it ever leaks out to the world, it's just a meaningless hash. So it's a pretty cool way to interact. But other companies try to do it different ways, so that's, that's another potential for research. Have they messed it up? Can any of this data like leak from an internal organization? So uh, I realize I hit you with a lot of stuff here, but um, Things might be getting better you know, on the horizon. So we've entered the metropolis phase of Ethereum right now that, that goes to releases. Uh, it started with this thing called Byzantium. Now we're moving to Constantinople in the next five months. And it's eerily similar to my name, so you know that's cool. I'll just rock that. But, um, so what's going on with metropolis is, uh, for the first time, we're going to have uh, crypto primitives. Uh, so if you ever heard of Zcash, it's sort of like a private uh, cryptocurrency. Um, sort of private. There's still forensic ways to detect where the money was moving from. But, uh, now, Ethereum's going to have those crypto primitives called ZK Snarks. So in theory, very soon, we should be able to have private Ethereum transactions. So this world's biggest supercomputer um, will be able to have completely private transactions, which is cool because I believe in a very decentralized private internet, and uh, I'm pushing for that. So I think it'll be neat. The only problem is there'll be all that bad press. People are going to say, oh no, Ethereum is the new dark web drug money, you know? Um, and those people are silly because the only people on the dark web now are police officers and FBI agents and things like that. <laughs> Good luck buying something on the dark web. You're just going to be talking to a cop, I promise you. Um, there's also going to be some other cool stuff done. Um, wallet abstraction is coming. Uh, for the first time, we're going to have a mainstream blockchain that will be quantum resistant. Because uh, I don't know if you know this, but Bitcoin is teetering on disaster. If someone gets a quantum computer of sufficient size within the next five years, they can download the Bitcoin blockchain and take their time reversing every single private key that has ever belonged to a wallet that spent a Bitcoin ever. So if you've ever spent any Bitcoin or moved any Bitcoin, whatever, they'll be able to get your private key and take your money. So the value of Bitcoin will go from its pitiful 6,300 to a pitiful zero instantly. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done, but at least Ethereum's already doing that. Um, and also we have some cool things coming in Casper and sharding. Uh, Casper is going to allow for um, this uh, proof of stake instead of proof of work because you hear a lot of times about people complaining about it costs the like, electricity of a small country to mine a coin or whatever. Uh, proof of stake will help that and sharding will also speed up transaction times. So we might really be on the cusp of a Web 3.0. Um, it, it's time to you know, give a good, good look at this because it's more than just about the security of smart contracts. It might just be a whole new way of computing without any centralized choke points or chance of censorship or anything like that. So it's a pretty exciting uh, time to get into hacking this sort of stuff. So I'll leave you with that. And uh, I know we ran over because we started late, so I just figured uh, if anyone wants to catch me in the hall, I'm the guy whose head is floating above everyone else's, so you'll probably find me very easily. Uh, so feel free. So you guys can follow me at Constant Hacker if you want to see what crazy things I'm talking about in this space. And uh, thank you. Thank you.